to a different world, a uh, different world of futurists who talk about things differently. I've been enjoying uh, this strange world I've visited here the last few days, where there's a lot of inspiring, emotional, uh, emotionally true things said, and uh, ways people are motivated and, and say things that they mean and feel, but I can't usually take them entirely literally the way I'm used to. And so I'm warning you, I'm going to be literal. I'm analytic. I, I'm an academic, and I'm a university professor of economics, and I'm going to be, in a sense, straight and, and just see what that's like. First of all, I wanted to, since you're futurist, I wanted to tell you about an area of psychology research I think is fascinating. Uh, it's called construal level theory, and it's focused on how we differently process things that are far away or near in a visual scene, which is related to abstract and concrete things. So when we see a visual scene, we usually think things, many little things far away, and a few big things up close. And the far away things we think about more abstractly, they have very few features and we categorize them a lot. And the few things that we see up close have a lot of detail, and we focus on that detail. And it turns out that uh, we have this consistent way we process a lot of things so that when we see something far away in space, we tend to assume it's far away in time and social distance and hypotheticality, and that it's abstract, so there are relatively few categories and things are more consistent within each category, and even the colors go along because we think of them far away and they tend to be bluer when they're far away, and we think things up close and they tend to be red. And in our goals, when we plan things, our abstract goals are like high-level principles of life, and our near considerations tend to be concrete, practical, and strength that get in our way. And so when we're in far mode, we tend to be focused on basic values, broad categories, and we tend to be really confident in our theories. And when we're in near mode, oh, we tend to focus on details, and we see exceptions, and we see a lot of complexity. Let me just say, love is far, sex is near, that you should get it now. Uh, and it turns out they first saw this uh, in studying people thinking about the distant future. That's where they first saw the difference between these modes, and it was a very far mode in the future, which is why there is a consistent futuristic style, which has the consistent element this theory predicts of blue, shiny, relatively weak textures, a few objects, lots of big surfaces, relative litter patterns, and futuristic stories tend to have big focus on high values, important fundamental principles, etc. So I let, leave that to you to reflect on how it might explain how you treat the future differently than you would treat something right up close to you now and how futurism tends to be different than other sorts of subjects. But let me set that aside and go to my main subject here. This is a summary of history from the point of view of an economist at least. Uh, the y-axis here is growth rates and the x-axis is time and they're both logarithmic and so you can see the entire history or so. From about half a billion years ago to about two million years ago, brains in animals were slowly growing, doubling roughly every 30 million years. And then humans showed up maybe roughly two million years ago, and the number of humans has been doubling roughly every quarter million years. And then roughly 10,000 years ago, there was the farming revolution, and suddenly the growth rate increased dramatically, so that the number of humans have been doubling roughly every thousand years since about 10,000 years ago. And then the Industrial Revolution showed up a couple hundred years ago, and since then the economies have been doubling every 15 years. Over this entire history, we've seen an overall acceleration, but you shouldn't miss think that that means that steady acceleration. Instead, what we've seen is relatively steady growth in a certain mode, and then a sudden transition to a much faster mode, growing over 100 times faster, and that transition happening in less than a previous doubling time. And the straightforward question you might ask is, could that happen again? And if it were to happen again, and you were to follow the previous statistics here and just predict it, you'd say, well, it would happen sometime in roughly the next century, which isn't very precise. It would take less than five years. And within that time period, we would transition to a new economy that would then double every week or month. And, I, and that's a relatively sharp prediction. So a straightforward question might be then, could it happen and what would cause that? And one of the most common speculations about what would cause a big transition is robots. So I'm going to talk about the robot transition scenario. So let's think about ways to make robots. So uh, 
The world, the community I come from, and other ways of thinking about the future is often called singularitarians. By singularity, they just tend to mean a world suddenly with lots of robots. And so, uh, let's just talk robots. How could we make a world of robots? And I'm talking not just ordinary robots that you've seen, but robots at the human level ability such that they could displace most or lots of humans, which is nowhere near where we are now. So I was an artificial intelligence researcher many years ago, and there's been a whole a field of research. Of course, there's a larger field of software uh, development. And I've been in the uh, practice of going and visiting at conferences and things, people who've been in AI research for at least 20 years, and asking them, in the field you know best, your field, in the last 20 years, how far have we come? Are we almost there? Uh, how far have we come as a percentage of the total distance from where we were 20 years ago to human level abilities in your subfield? What they tell me is usually 5 to 10%. Multiply it, and they say no noticeable acceleration. So project that out, what does that mean? That's two to four centuries. So that's the rate at which we are progressing toward human level AI in the ability to just write better software, put it together like that. So it could happen, and of course the progress slows down and takes even longer. I know many people who think it will happen sooner, they actually take surveys, people they often say it'll happen sooner, and the argument they give is, well, past progress isn't an indication of future progress, we're gonna have this big breakthrough. There'll be this big discovery. We don't really have the grand theory of intelligence yet, but when we have it, boy, it'll be great. And some people think the recent developments in deep learning are, hey, we've almost there, look at that, that's so cool, and they love cool demos. And so uh, there is some excitement about that. I tend to be skeptical, I've been around for a while, I've seen cool demos for a very long time, so I say, no, no, not really. So I'm gonna talk about a third path to intelligent robots, the one I think is most likely to happen sooner, and that's just basically taking software that we know already exists and works and porting it to a new system. And that's called brain emulation. So what we need to emulate brains is we need a lot of really cheap computers. Of course, we have computers on our trajectory to get cheap. We need to take a real human brain, or many of them, and scan it in great, fine, spatial and chemical detail. This is where I warned you about being literal. And yes, I'm being literal. Real human brain actually directly scanning it being destructive probably in the first scans. And then you have models of how each brain cell works, i.e. how it takes input signals from the outside, changes the internal state, sends signals to the outside, and how you can tell different kinds of cells from the scans, such that you can put all of these three things together and build a computer model of an entire individual human brain. And if the models of the parts are good enough, and if the scan is good enough, then by definition, the whole thing should work as a model of the whole brain. What does that mean? It takes the same input signals and produces the same internal state changes and output signals, i.e. you could talk to it, it would talk back, you could yell at it, it might yell back, you could ask it nicely to do a job and maybe you would do it in the same way that the original person would. It would love, hate, yell, uh, create, etc. in the same way the original would, exactly because it's an emulation of the original. That's what a brain emulation is. and at existing trends, uh, it's plausible that this could happen within the next century. Not the next 20 years, the next century. So therefore, faster than the other routes. Therefore, this is plausibly the way we will have robots that are as good as people. So I'm going to talk about this scenario. So I'm going to be conservative. I know we've heard a number of uh, presentations about how like, the standard economics is all wrong and there's alternatives that are better. I'm gonna just take the standard economics and the standard everything. I am going to be a very conservative intellectual and just take the standard consensus in all sorts of fields and just apply it to this question, what would a world of these emulations be like? I'm not gonna talk about would they be conscious, would they be me, I don't care. That's, that's overdone. I'm also not gonna talk about, which is again, the literal thing, whether it's good or bad or whether you like it or not. I'm gonna just try to analyze exactly what would happen in my best guess using all the same tools, whether I like it or not, or whether you like it or not. Not my job to defend the future. It is what it is, and I just wanna tell you about it. Okay? Next, I'm gonna focus on the robots, not the humans. The humans are marginalized, they're off on the side, they don't matter so much anymore. I'm gonna talk about the robots. Next, I'm not gonna tell you about the indefinite future, how we're gonna expand and colonize the galaxy, et cetera. I'm gonna talk about the next era, 
And if the next error is like the last ones, it might only last two years. And then after that, something else would happen. But if you want to know what happens after that, you don't know what's happening next, good luck. <laughs> okay? So, and I'm going to talk about what this world looks like as an equilibrium when it's roughly settled down, not like the transition to get there, because that's more complicated. And as a standard economist, I'm going to use the standard intellectual tools we have to make what are called simplifying assumptions that we know how to figure out the consequences of, even if they're not the most likely assumptions. Because this is what we do. We take the, the scenario we can best analyze, we do that first, and then we look at variations that we can work on. So because of that, I'm going to analyze a competitive, low-regulation scenario. You can call it capitalism if you like. <laughs> but there's a lot of people making these things, a lot of people buying them. They're free to do that all over the place, and we see what happens. Uh, I'm also going to simplify my analysis by saying, Okay, we can make these emulations, we can copy them, we could run them faster or slower. We can't reach in and take this guy's music and add it to that guy's soccer ability and, and this guy's sense of humor and make some combination thing. We, we don't know how to do that. They're just opaque black boxes, we can copy them or not. So that simplifies my analysis, means we don't have to worry about how we change their minds. So those are my working assumptions, and from here on, I'm just going to tell you what this world is like. And it's weird. Right up, and it's weird, but it's all derived from very standard assumptions. I'm not making any sort of radical revolutionary approach to anything different. I'm taking all the standard results in all the fields I can, but applying it to these assumptions. And I have a book on this coming out by next spring. You're welcome to email me, and I might even send you a draft. You can send me comments, and it covers this range of topics. So I'm giving you a sense. I'm covering a lot of different topics. I'm going into great detail. I'm only going to have time to cover a few of them here. So let's start. First, I'm going to tell you about things that are true for all kinds of robot futures, even if it's a different robot future from this one. There's a lot of things robots in general have in common. One is robots are intrinsically immortal, in the same way that your house and car are immortal. What? Yes, if you keep repairing your house and car, you can keep them indefinitely. What? You don't keep repairing them? Yeah, robots might be like that. <laughs> you might not actually keep them forever, but you could if you kept paying. Uh, robots can be stored electronically, so they can be transmitted electronically, so they can travel electronically. Yes, they beam me up, beam me over, whatever it is, robots can move uh, efficiently that way. We love nature. We are scared that if we kill nature, we will die. It's a good fear. Uh, robots don't have that fear. Robots can kill nature and still live. They may save nature because they like it, but they aren't as scared as we are. You maybe should be scared about that. <laughs> robots can make copies, and a great many things follow from this one fact. So robots can you make copies of them easy, easy, so we'll say a whole bunch of things about how this changes careers, it changes the concentration of labor markets. Well, one very basic thing is, is it makes wages fall to subsistence levels. This is a Malthusian world where pe the wages are barely enough to cover people's cost of existence, which is the computer hardware, the energy to run it, the communication bottleneck, the real estate to sit in, etc. They need to cover these costs, and the wages, the median wages, are barely enough to cover them. It's a Malthusian world. Because of that, the growth rates can be much higher, and in fact, they can double every week or month. <laughs> and so, this scenario can fit with the stats we had before. Uh, it's a very competitive world because of this, and so we will we can use economic competition theory to make a lot of predictions, and that's a lot what's driving a lot of my analysis. It's using the theory of competition to figure out what happens. Humans are eclipsed. Sorry. Maybe you should think in terms of identifying with the robots instead of the humans in this world, because the humans are marginally off to the side. Um, humans can't compete with these robots anymore. Uh, if they only own their ability to earn wages, then they don't own enough to live. But if you own anything else in this world, which is enormously getting rich really fast, so if the economy doubles every week, your investments double every week, which means a very small initial investment can grow very quickly to a lot. So you, if you own anything else in this world, you can still be rich, and you should be thinking of yourself as a retiree. So the best solution for humans is to be the rich retirees of the world of robots, <laughs> living on their estates off to the side, enjoying their retirement income, just like many of you may hope to or do enjoy your retirement income and live off of the rest. So people talk about, what if, why don't the robots kill all the humans? What's, what are humans worth to the robots? And you might say, why don't we kill off all the retirees? What are they worth it to the rest of us? But we don't. And there are some good reasons for that, and we can hope that that would happen in the robot world as well. Let's be the nice, friendly retirees to the robot world. 
So now let me talk about emulations. That's this particular kind of robot. And I'm going to talk about this particular kind because I can say a lot more things about it. it these assumptions are more concrete and have a lot more specific implications. So one, it's a very competitive world. And so out of 7 billion people to emulate, they wouldn't randomly emulate people. They would emulate the best, i.e. the ones who were most suitable for the emulation economy. And that means probably out of a few hundred humans, the copies of them would dominate the emulation economy. So they would be familiar humans that if you talk to one, they would be recognizably the human. They have a human sense of humor, a human sense of motivation and love, but they're not typical humans. They are exceptional humans. They are better than the average billionaire, Olympic gold medalist, Nobel Prize winner, etc., at doing the things they do. And we actually know a bunch of things that are correlated with people who are more productive, so I just predict they will be more like this. They will be smarter, conscientious, etc., even religious, because that tends to correlate with people being more productive. So this is basically how I'm doing it. analysis. Yes, uh, they, are, they are virtuous, they are productive, they, are, they might look fondly back on you as their ancestors, but they think they're better than you. And they're right. <laughs> they are better than you. <laughs> yes, whatever works. If, if yes. If, if they're required to, yes. Uh, so they're, but psychologically, the human, they're not programmed any more than you are, which is a lot, admittedly. Uh, so emulations mostly uh, leisure in virtual reality, almost entirely, and most of their jobs would be in virtual reality because most of them would have desk jobs, like most people in an advanced economy today would have desk jobs. But because they're emulations, they could be in a virtual reality desk job. So. It's very cheap in virtual reality and have spectacular quality food and, and uh, lighting and vistas and, and office furniture. And you can see these are beautiful places that you might see in virtual reality, but they all have desks because they're working a lot. <laughs> so they have a beautiful, and they, they have spectacular feelings and surroundings. They never need to get sick or, or hungry or anything, but nevertheless, they have to work a lot because it's very competitive. Um, so I was asked to emphasize especially issues of identity and uh, spirituality. And so here's one first way to emphasize that. Historically, the biggest trauma the human race went through, I would say, is the trauma in moving from foraging to farming. As foragers, we were very well adapted to our environment and to our way of life. We evolved that way. And then when we had to be farmers, it was a wrenching change because it did not feel natural. And we used all the social pressures available to humans, religion, conformity, etc., to turn foragers into farmers to make them do the kinds of things they needed to do to be farmers. Uh, and so farmers are more comfortable with domination, slavery, violence, uh, inequality, self-control, a variety of things you can see over here listed. And foragers are more into the kinds of things we are into. So you can summarize this by saying uh, primates before humans were actually kind of more like farmers. They had more explicit dominance hierarchies and more explicit violence, and foragers became more peaceful and uh, egalitarian and leisure-oriented. And then farming moved us over back toward more like what was before with primates. And then in the last few hundred years, as we've gotten rich, we've tended to go back to what feels natural when we're comfortable, when we don't need to be scared because we're rich enough, and so we've gone more back to forager ways in the last few centuries. And so a lot of trends over the last few centuries can be understood in terms of moving back to forager ways. And a lot of you are proud of that. And that's, in a sense, Maslow's hierarchy is, in a sense, moving up to the sorts of things foragers value more. Travel, uh, art, uh, egalitarian you know, community, discussion, etc. Uh, and so a lot of you are very proud that we've moved that way in the last 100 years because it feels natural, it feels right, it feels like we finally figured out what the right way to do things. Unfortunately, my prediction is, in the end world, we go back to the farming ways. That is, it's a more competitive world, it's a world that requires more behavior that feels less natural, and so the same pressures that produce farmers to take on the farming ways and attitudes would also produce, induce M's to take on those same kinds of strong self-control, determination, grit sort of preferences about hard work and being loyal to your community and things like that. So I predict the M's move more back that way, whether you like it or not. Again, I don't have to defend the future, I'm just predicting it. <laughs> All right, I'm using my tools analysis. Now, 
Many of you may have thought that you were felt so weird at some point in your life. And maybe you thought, really, I came from another planet. And, and someday I'll find the rest of my planet. They'll come and come for me. And I'll just find all these people who are really just like me. And that'll be just so great. Okay? And you're probably disappointed that that wasn't true. <laughs> for M's, it'll be like that. That is, the top few hundred M's uh, that dominate the world economy, uh, there's only a few hundred of them so they can know each other personally, at least in terms of generic personalities like foragers did, because they only had a few hundred people they ever met. And for each one of them, there's billions of other ones just like them that they could talk to at any time that really are personality-wise just like them. And they're all available, so every one of them really does have a planet of ones just like them to talk to at any time. Uh, your life in time is like this line. You start, you end, that's it. Emulation is going to have a more variety of lives. So now you can think about how they feel about these varieties. This is somebody who every day splits off a few copies as needed to go to the DM, stay in line at the DMV, mow the lawn, whatever else it is. And most of these copies but one end at the end of the day, and they continue on, you see. Now here's someone who's more opportunistic. They split off different copies as different, you know, different jobs show up for different opportunities. And depending on which ones have more demand, they'll make more copies of those and less of the others. Eventually demand fiddles away. This is a recursive software engineer or a recursive diet designer of some sort. They make a big overall plan for a system. Then they, break them, then they split into copies who focus on subsystems, make subsystem design, so on down to the finest grain of the system. Then of course they do the design, do checks back, test back up until they're done with the whole system. One guy's left and he has a bunch of you know, messages and recordings from others who did the other parts and of course he could revive those copies as necessary to ask the questions. This is a plumber who remembers for 20 years only ever working two hours a day. Every day when it was time to work, he split off into a thousand copies, each of whom did two hours of work and one of them went on until the next day. Objectively, almost all of his time was working, but in his memory, it was almost all leisure. That's the kind of way this world can be like. Um, so, people have a sense that uh, this is a terrible world because people are dying all the time. You make these short-term copies and then they're over. But it's not clear that they will think of it that way. Most likely they'd be selected not to think of it that way. So, if you or I went to a party where at the beginning of the party we took a drug such that at the end of the party we won't remember the next day, right? Uh, we don't usually at the end of the party think, I'm about to die. We're not terrified of death at the end of the party, because we think we will go on, we just realize the one who goes on won't remember this party. So they can think about these short-term versions of themselves that way. This is a set of transitions that takes you from uh, an ordinary person to someone with a separate copy. Each of these transitions seems innocuous. So I predict that because uh, they're much more likely to, to exist and reproduce and to be successful in this world, people who take the attitude that it's not death, just to split off a copy who lasts for a short time and isn't remembered, uh, they, that's the attitude they will have. So they will see themselves as having immortality, in a sense. Um, in our life, uh, our lifespan is split into initial training, and then we work, and then we retire at the end of life, and then it's over, and there's stress about it being over, of course. For M's, they train one or fewer copies, and then they split into many copies of work. So training becomes much cheaper, so you can invest a lot more in, in high-quality training. And then retirement can be done slow. So retirement becomes much more cheaper too. So, and retirement can be indefinite. So you, so you don't have to fear death. What you have to fear is when you're no longer productive, and I'll explain that in a moment, as productive to compete with others, then you will retire to a slow retirement where suddenly the world will come speed by faster than it goes for other people who are still working. And you don't have to fear death unless civilization dies. And so now everybody suddenly has an, incent an interest, a strong personal interest, including the humans, in keeping civilization alive, because otherwise uh, they die too. Um, it turns out that um, a lot of systems have the general phenomenon that as they adapt to changing circumstances, they uh, become fragile and they can't readapt to new circumstances very well. This happens with species, with cells, with software, which rots. It happens with human minds, which get fragile over time. And so this is the source of humans having a limited, the ends having a limited productive lifespan after which they would become, uh, need to retire so they couldn't compete with younger versions of themselves. Uh, so these are some basic stats about the world that I've been saying to summarize. And 
Uh, the typical emulation speed would be about a thousand times human speed. So that's based on some considerations I could go into. But basically that means the world to them is a slower changing world than ours is. So it's an era that lasts two years, and in that era, vast numbers of things happen from the human's point of view, but from the resident's point of view, it's a slow era that takes 2,000 years and uh, is more slowly changing than our world changes, so their world is more stable. And here's a number of pluses and minuses we could talk about. Uh, about this world, you may like some elements, you may hate others. Again, not my job. But uh, to help you reflect on whether you like or don't like this world, uh, these are some things about it. So positives, no pain, no hunger, no disease, You're always in a beautiful young body, never need to be terrified of death, uh, huge population of creatures who enjoy their lives. On the other hand, there's vast inequality within this world. By speeds in particular, there are many of these things that end quickly. They're working a lot of hours. Not much nature necessarily, or alienation, but great investment in arts and things like that. Uh, but let me stop now and ask for a few questions before my time's up. Uh, nobody. So there is software in this world, of course. Some of the M's would write software, but the M's are copies of humans, so nobody wrote the code. They are just like us, in the sense that who wrote your code? Well, your parents in some sense, but nobody's explicitly doing the emulations. Nobody consciously is designing their code. They are just copies of humans, so they act like humans do, and they are unpredictable or predictable as we are. Question in the back. In this world, uh, what? Why do they not um, we make work to be played? And Why don't we? Well, uh, this, wouldn't this be uh, the end of economics to, to have things that were intrinsically fulfilling in a do-it-yourself uh, I'm sure the economy will try to make work seem as fun as possible. We, we do it today as much as we can. We try to make work seem fun so we don't have to... There's a whole world of uh, things that I don't like where we take real people doing real jobs and we say, you know, if only we could uh, gamify that, then people would do it for free. We wouldn't have to pay them salaries, right? It doesn't work so well. There's a lot of things you just can't gamify very well. I predict that it'll be a long time away before you can gamify everything. Great question. So that was when I said less nature and space. I'm alluding to the fact that it takes a long time to get to Mars or farther out there. The economy's doubling every week or month. The opportunity cost for a one-year trip anywhere is enormous. So basically, there might be some things done by a few rich people who do not mind that cost, but basically the economy will simply wait a few years before it does much in space. Again, an enormous amount happens in only a couple of years here, a vast increase in the economy. At the end of that, the economy looks enormously different, but... Oh, is that a question? Um, are they, where are they going to go out? Uh, so the emulations don't exist yet. Well, the of this is now. They don't, so there is a whole field of brain research where they take brains and try to scan them. And so these technologies we need to make this work, we need brain scans, we need computers, we need cell models. These are all various levels of development. Brain scans will probably be done first. Cell models might be last. Uh, we need those things all together before we can make it. Work, there are you know, smaller versions of brain models that just aren't remotely good enough to do this yet. So this is a, a threshold technology. Until you have a whole emulation that really works, you don't have much valuable here. You, you just have a so curiosity. How, how, where are we now in relation to that? How would you describe that? So that's, I, um, I, I didn't include a slide that gave a timeline, but uh, basically sometime in the next century. So probably not in the next 20 years, probably not longer than a century, sometime in that time frame, which I know is a large, sorry, that's the best I can do. Yeah, sometime in the next century. Twenty? Yeah, probably. So remember when I said two to four centuries about ordinary robots? We're just a long way away. Ordinary robots are just crap. Sorry. It, it, relative to human abilities, ordinary robots are just so far be, behind what humans are up to that you shouldn't really feel very threatened about your jobs mostly. Got it. <laughs> Until the robots come, one way or another, and then yeah, they should, you should worry. It was a So most of them, it would be big, you know, warehouses of computers like we have now in the cloud, where, where there's lots and lots of, you know, big servers. Not, is it the 
Well, some of them would. They would have physical bodies, but even then would probably just teleoperate the bodies as convenient and leave the brains back. Some of them may put the brains inside bodies if they're especially far away from you know, standard facilities, but most of them would just... This entire scenario happens in two human years. Uh, you know, millennia of civilization experience among the ends happen in two human years. So basically, the humans are constant over those two years. Seven billion at the beginning, seven billion at the end, all the same ones, you know, all the same personalities. Humans are frozen, in a sense, off to the side, not changing enough to make much difference. Well, robots enjoy virtual technology. So, uh, <laughs> Virtual reality would be where they live mostly, so they would be very eager to, for better virtual you know, ficuses or virtual cats or whatever else is in their virtual reality that they like. They'd be eager for those, and they're cheap. Virtual reality things are very cheap to develop, so they all have lots of them. Once you make one, you can have tons. Am I out of time? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Oh,